Today on Leaf by Leaf, Pedro Paramo by Juan Rufo. The most iconic writer of magical realism is probably Gabriel Garcia Marquez, but it was the 1955 publication of Juan Rufo's Pedro Paramo that spearheaded this type of surrealist exposition we know and love so well today. In fact, Garcia Marquez said that he could quote this book by heart and that the examination in depth of Juan Rufo's work gave me at last the way I sought to continue my books. And thus we got the 100 years of solitude six years after Garcia Marquez had his epiphany with Pedro Paramo. According to Carlos Fuentes, Rufo gave the Mexican novel its highest expression and led to the new Latin American novel. And Susan Sontag says in her foreword to the book, Rufo's novel is not only one of the masterpieces of 20th century world literature, but one of the most influential of the century's books. At around 125 pages, it is short indeed, but it makes a huge impact. Where Cesare's The Invention of Morel, for example, lends its impact to the final sequence of the story, Pedro Paramo is a steady stream of little twists and epiphanies that constantly shakes the reader's expectations. As its non-linear double timeline pulses along, the book continues to rewrite what the reader thinks they know. It is one of those books made to be read again and again, with the enthusiasm of a young, hale, lithe reader. Put your pen down, put the highlighter down, toss aside the post-it notes, Close your writing journal. Don't even think about dog-earing a page, ever, with any book. Read it like a young adolescent in the 1990s, with a favorite Nancy Drew, or Babysitter's Club, or Hardy Boys, or Goosebumps, your parents just bought you at the Scholastic Book Fair. The time for analysis and criticism can come later. It's time to experience the pure joy of reading a book without the pressure to try and get everything. I admit that I started to create a genealogical chart on one of the end papers like I normally do, but quickly found that I kept making erroneous assumptions and had to put that aside. Reading the book is like tracing backwards through the concentric circles of time rippling outwardly on the shimmering surface of a glass lake. We begin in the first person with Juan Preciado, whose mother's dying wish is for him to travel to Kamala, find his father. Pedro Barmo and get what he owes them. But the book unexpectedly shifts to the past and we are half inside of and outside of the mind of the father. The narrative thread tunnels through wormholes of different characters, thoughts, and words, and deeds. The reader must be attentive. Every word counts. Rufo gives just enough material to keep your place but not so much detail that the enchantment of the surrealism is diminished. Think of the way Christopher Nolan handles all of the levels in the movie Inception. It's disorienting, but in a way that exhilarates. The story is relentlessly atmospheric. Water is a metaphor that runs throughout the entire book, from rainstorms to light drizzle to mists to steady dripping of rivulets and trickles. Water and time are as conflated as the weather and mood. After a few reads, you'll notice the way weather and situations relate. In fact, the very first time and perspective shift hinges on water. In the Juan Preciado narrative, it reads, I felt I was in a faraway world and let myself be pulled along by the current. Then, after the shift, the Pedro Paramo narrative begins. Water dripping from roof tiles was forming a hole in the sand of the patio. Plink, plink, and another plink as drops struck a bobbing, dancing laurel leaf caught in a crack between the adobe bricks. What mesmerizing descriptive prose. Notice that description of the dancing laurel leaf caught between the adobe bricks. 
These crevices and in-betweens will abound as we begin to find that the veil between the living and the dead is not only thin, it's largely non-existent. The Kamala Juan Preciado enters is a literal ghost town, and these sequences are intertwined with the bustling revolutionary days of Pedro Paramo. Rufo weaves a Mexico of magical realism out of conventional superstition and Catholic mysticism. Sins, pardons, blessings, curses, absolution, death, purgatory, heaven, hell, and all the places in between flood the narrative with an unending procession of life in all of its effervescent squirming and transitioning. In this way, it is sort of like a Mexican Ovid for the 20th century. Nestled within the story of Juan's father, who in one sense has killed all the men and slept with all the women of old Kamala, is a torrid love story of madness and death, reminiscent of Catherine Earnshaw and Heathcliff. Their love was in a sense too powerful for reality and exists on a spiritual plane, a plane that has been pierced through by horrific acts of greed, power, lust, and violence. The large-scale suffering of Kamala of the past has locked its ghostly inhabitants in an endless purgatory. This collision of states of being is rendered so seamlessly that at least one character's passage from life to death will likely go unnoticed on your first read. Everything is personified and capable of being trapped in an in-between. Voices, echoes, emotions, people, animals. The town is filled with echoes, Damiana Cisneros tells Juan. It's like they were trapped between the walls or beneath the cobblestones. There are moments that border on the eerie ambience of Giorgio de Maria's 20 days of Turin. Nights around here are filled with ghosts. You should see all the spirits walking through the streets. There's so many of them and so few of us that we don't even make an effort to pray for them anymore. You will want to read this book, or read it again. Rufo published only this novel and one short story collection in his mid-40s, found instant acclaim, and never published again. As Susan Sontag says, the point of a writer's life is to produce a great book. That is, a book that will last. And this is what Rufo did.